Welcome to part four of the evolution of civilization, the human animal, on the Enlightened Society podcast. Welcome back to our new origin story, our new and informed mythology about who we are and where we came from. In this episode, we'll continue the journey from the place we left off previously, the origin of life, and now we turn to our own human species. There may have been as many as 40 billion different species over the history of this planet. 99.9% .9 are gone. Each species made up of countless individuals. Each being had a life, one that mattered to it, just like ours matters to us. But they were just one form of the DNA which survived them. In fact, we are all the DNA that has existed for billions of years. Therefore, in essence, we are billions of years old, and of course connected to every other being that is made up of DNA. In fact, this could be one mechanism, a scientific one, for understanding the Hindu idea of reincarnation. Every being is like the fruiting body of DNA, similar to what the mushroom is to mycelium, or an apple is to a tree except on a much larger scale. The DNA fruits a tree, which in turn fruits an apple, and then this process repeats. Not to mention the atoms or the energy that makes up the universe and existence itself. Every one of us is a survivor along an entire lineage of survivors. Generations upon generations, back to the beginning of life as we know it. We are all family, connected to every other living being on earth. It's fitting that we should celebrate this knowledge by telling that story, the story of who we are and where we came from. It's a miraculous story because our ancestors, all living beings, were the characters that made it. How many times did we sing to each other? How many times did we fight each other? in our task to understand ourselves. Just like before, we won't get bogged down in all the scientific terminology, and especially now, our human lineage uses such arcane names, and if I start using words like artipithecus or afarensis, I'm likely to make my own eyes glaze over. We also won't be concerned with covering every aspect of human evolution but rather showing the broad trajectories which make the story so fascinating that you want to learn more about specific details on your own. We'll look at humanity holistically, including our mental and spiritual journey, and we'll also touch on technology, geography, and climate change over large timescales. One of the most important things to consider is that real-life events are largely lost in the past but our imagination can make them live again. That's why it's important to remember, to notice, to imagine. The pressures of finding food, of our daily fears and struggles, of our joys, of our companionship, of overcoming the odds. We'll spend most of the episode looking at the period between 2 million years ago and 10,000 years ago. That's called the Pleistocene, which means the newest epoch. It covers the bulk of the human lineage. As mentioned in our last episode, we split off from the other apes around 20 million years ago. Since then, there's been many species of apes spread across the world, a real planet of the apes. Over that time, one of those ape species evolved into four lineages that still remain today. Gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans. The next major milestone was around four million years ago when we diverged again. This is the point where we began standing up regularly. This is the first time that we have evidence of our ancestors walking upright. We have a pelvis bone which shows this change as well as actual footprints in ancient clay. At this time, we lived in both open areas and dense woods, 
Our body shape allowed us to walk upright most of the time, but still climb trees. As a result, we could take advantage of both habitats. We did this as a result of the change in climate that turned jungles into savannas. Thus, the large numbers of trees in Central Africa disappeared. Standing up allowed us to free our hands for more productive purposes. And our hands, with opposable thumbs, allowed us to hold and manipulate objects and make things. It allowed us to dominate everything around us, from other animals to each other. It allowed us to see great distances. At this time, we would have been around four feet tall on average, and our heads were slightly bigger than chimps today. We were scavengers, tracking herds of animals and also foraging, looking for fruits and nuts, seeds, mushrooms. This is the time of Lucy, the name given to the famous fossilized skeleton. Our upright stature allowed us to hunt animals, and this regular supply of meat likely led to an increase in brain size, though the full potential of that remained largely unused until much later. Just after this time, three and a half million years ago, our descendants began making the most complex tools yet, what we would call a simple tool, a sharp rock which has been chipped carefully and precisely. The stone tools included large and small scrapers, choppers, hammer stones. They also made carrying containers. The first tool shouldn't be minimized. It was a substantial leap forward over all other animals. It proved that our ancestors could think, that they could be creative and build what they could imagine. And this was the first in a long line of new inventions and innovations. The moment in time when we first began to use our new abilities was truly special. Real individuals made these discoveries by accident and by intuition. Individuals with whole lives and significant moments in them who may have glimpsed far into the future about what could become of these new powers. Around two million years ago, one ape species again rapidly diverged into many species, including the one that led to us. This is the Homo branch with names like Homo erectus and eventually Homo sapiens. This is the point at which our ancestors look most like us than at any time before. The skeletal structure is close enough that they would go almost unnoticed in a crowd. They weighed over 100 pounds and now males averaged around five feet high. Females were usually a foot shorter. The shape of the heads was different though, smaller than us now and it looked more rugged. This is the time of our first great migration, when some of the Homo group moved north into the Middle East, and then moved east through India, then China, and then Indonesia. It was colder in these places than it was in Africa, and they didn't move much further north than that because it was so much colder, and they probably hadn't mastered fire yet. In addition, plant food was not available all year round in the northern regions. Here we see the first hints of social structure beyond the traditional ape society. We see evidence of our first fire use at a million years ago, and learn to fully control fire soon after. The ability to start fire at will was one of the most important advancements. What a miracle it was when we learned to create fire from seemingly nowhere. This ability must have been breathtaking to the first person, and then to those who were first taught this skill. It must have been considered magic, perhaps even kept a secret. It gave us the ability to stay warm, to cook animals and plants, make them taste better and easier to eat. We could even set whole areas on fire and use it as a weapon. But beyond that, it was the first time that we sat around a fire at night and stared into it to wonder and marvel at its chaotic beauty. Only the sun rivaled its majesty. 
Perhaps some even considered that they were related somehow. This technology was the beginning of a revolution, one that eventually led to metallurgy at the dawn of civilization, which led to controlled combustion and modern technology. We see a rapid increase in brain size at this time, from around 800,000 years ago to 300,000 years ago. Larger brains slowly allowed us to create more complex thoughts and societies and enabled us to interact with each other and with our surroundings in new ways. By now, the Homo group had moved into most of Europe, from Germany in the north to the British Isles in the west. Which leads us to the next two milestones in human evolution. The Neanderthals at 500,000 years ago, followed by the Cro-Magnon 50,000 years ago. These two milestones provide the vital conceptual background in our evolution. The Neanderthals likely left Africa in small bands. They moved through the Middle East and continued moving east through India, then China, and into Malaysia, just like the Homo group before. Eventually they made their way north into Russia, then west into Central Europe, and finally Western Europe, and then south into Spain. The other Homo groups largely disappeared by the time Neanderthals arrived in Europe. We have very little information about the Neanderthals. Most of what we know comes from a few dozen fossils and artifacts. There were probably great differences in them over time and regions. Some groups and individuals would have been far smarter than others. They probably lived in families or clans of around 10 adults. They were nomadic and followed herd animals. They were likely very good hunters and were constantly mobile. They were bigger than us in most ways, from bones to teeth, brains, noses. It was much colder in Europe than in Africa, which would account for their relatively short arms and legs and large torso. They had larger heads than us, which were elongated from front to back, even football shaped. They would have adapted to the freezing temperatures during the cycles of ice ages and would have died out or migrated south as the ice sheets covered northern Europe from time to time. Neither they nor the animals that they hunted could have survived those freezing temperatures. Their body type meant that they had to consume twice as many calories per day as us and they expended more energy when running after animals. They lost most of their body hair and were lighter skin than their predecessors. In the north, there was not enough light to penetrate the skin to create the darker pigments, and because it was colder, they remained clothed most of the time. Intellectually and culturally, they had the same potential as us, but didn't use it for whatever reason. They didn't show signs of language like us though they likely had complex communication. They didn't adapt to the technologies of their competitors, despite potentially thousands of years of overlap. They probably had cultural rituals, but we can only guess at what these were. They probably had burial rituals, for example. What happened to the Neanderthals remains a mystery, but is likely a combination of many factors. But all of them revolve around the arrival of Cro-Magnon, the first modern humans in Europe around 50,000 years ago. Neanderthals were outcompeted in nearly every way. They went extinct as a separate group due to both assimilation and violence. Like our modern civilization, the clans likely battled each other and took each other's resources, kidnapped and took hostages. They also must have lost their best territory and resources due to better competition. They interbred with Cro-Magnon and likely succumbed to unknown diseases that the Cro-Magnon brought. Interbreeding may have been consensual at times, but rape was likely very common. They lived alone in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years and then suddenly vanished when Cro-Magnon arrived. They lived together with Cro-Magnon for probably a few thousand years, and the last remnants of them are found in Spain around 30,000 years ago. The difference between the two was an order of magnitude. 
Cro-Magnon showed up in Europe with far more understanding, capabilities, and technology, and therefore dominated every aspect of life, from taking the most fertile lands to simply outthinking them. Modern humans, meaning our direct lineage, can be traced back to East Africa 200,000 years ago, when we began to move north out of Africa. This is also the point at which our tool making became more lethal. We used multi-part tools called composite tools, including traps, complex spears, with tools made of flint, bone, antlers, and shells. Our ancestors lived in many places, but especially caves. Caves were a favorite place to live because they offer substantial protection from animals and from the weather. We built small and light fortifications as we moved around. We made and lived in all kinds of shelters, including mud stone houses. They lived in small bands of people and had a gender division of labor. They were participating in group hunting of large animals. The first signs of language appear around 100,000 years ago, and language as we know it today unleash the dormant power of the mind. Art also appears at this time. We have evidence of bracelets and beads, body art, and use painting materials such as ochre. Around 70,000 years ago, there was a bottleneck in human population, which dwindled to only a few thousand individuals. The reason is still unclear, but possibilities include disease or the eruption of the Toba supervolcano. At that time, global temperatures dropped by several degrees and created several years of ash-covered darkness on Earth. Regardless of the reason for the human bottleneck, one of many, we survived. Similar to the groups before them, they were the first out of Africa and ended up in Asia and then spread across Asia, then moved to Europe. Which finally brings us to the Cro-Magnon, the name given to the first ancestors in Europe. The name comes from the place in France where they were first discovered. As with the past migrations out of Africa, there were likely many reasons for modern humans to expand, but climate change was a major factor. During climate shifts, green corridors would have allowed safe passage through previously inhospitable terrain. They likely followed herds of animals during their seasonal migrations. Our particular human species began to move out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. They first moved into the Middle East, then into India. That line of humans continued into Southeast Asia and then Australia by 50,000 years ago. Another group of humans left Africa about this time and spread to China, then Russia, and then to Central Europe. To get to Europe through the Middle East requires crossing some of the largest mountain ranges on Earth, from Afghanistan to Iran, Iraq, northern Syria, Turkey, to Greece. They simply prevented large migrations. This is in addition to the lack of food and water in the deserts of the Middle East and Africa before they even reached the mountains. That said, yet another group left the Middle East and spread through Europe via Turkey and Greece by 40,000 years ago, probably due to climate shift and to their superior intellect and their ability to survive in nearly any condition. Cro-Magnon fossils have been found in Britain, Italy, Romania, and Russia as early as 40,000 years ago. They eventually crossed into the Americas around 15,000 years ago, across the Russian-Alaska land bridge, made of ice and tundra, and lived off of the sea, using small boats made of walrus skin, driftwood, and bone. They moved down through North America and into Central and South America, as with most migrations, they likely followed herd animals, and they also spread out due to increasing human populations. As for culture, our ancestors likely lived in clans of 10 to 20 people, who probably met periodically with others in more central locations 
to trade goods, among other things. We're not sure how violent or peaceful they were, but certainly they cooperated enough to survive. They likely had occasional large-scale fighting, but we don't see evidence of this before 30,000 years ago. There's evidence of division of labor among genders. Our ancestors had language for quite a while, and it certainly became more and more complex over time. But the first official languages didn't arise until humans settled down after 10,000 years ago with the Indo-Europeans. With language comes the ability to think complex thoughts and perform abstract reasoning. Likewise, self-consciousness arose and gave the ability to be aware of oneself in an interpersonal and interpersonal way, forming complex individuals and societies. In addition, teaching with language is superior than showing, but of course the combination is best. They could share ideas and knowledge. They could employ strategies based on data, such as using a particular type of bait and string and pole to catch a certain type of fish at certain times of the season. They could work together as a group to form a community and not just live together. Finally, with language comes the ability to organize and control large groups, which simply overwhelms animals and other opponents not to mention controlling each other. A corollary is the development of symbolic cultural artifacts like art, music, paintings, the beginnings of all the things we love today. This includes bone flutes, human and animal sculptures, and cave paintings of animals and humans. We have found engraved wooden objects as well as bones and antlers with pictures and information. Cro-Magnon also created jewelry from seashells. This shared culture ties people together and allows for an increased level of spreading of information. The cultural artifacts were practical in addition to being artistic. We invented sewing and therefore complex clothes using different types of hides for specialized purposes and making complex tools like needles and string, which enabled fitted clothing. Eventually, we see elaborate burials with weapons and beads, and these burials were likely for the spiritual leaders at first. It's virtually certain that they took various consciousness-altering plants, known as entheogens, and some theorize that these substances had substantial impacts on our language acquisition, creativity, and spirituality. As for technology, Cro-Magnon were hunter-gatherers. It was our ancestors' ability to not only imagine possible technologies, but also to create them through trial and error. Our ability to solve problems by using technologies replaced brute force. Our ancestors made more complex tools than ever before. And it was the tiny improvements and incremental steps that made such profound differences. For instance, they could make high-quality clothing from multiple pieces of hide by sewing them together for precise fit, making them more functional and warmer. They created needles from bones for sewing clothes and probably also used them for stitching wounds. They were highly specialized materials like flint tools created by specialized chipping techniques. They made barbed bone hooks on spears in order to fish. They could select the right woods for specific purposes such as boat making and create lashings to bind them together. As a result of our advanced technologies, we could make use of more varieties of foods and materials depending on what was available. The key was better, better everything in subtle yet important realms. Sharper rocks which were more intricately devised. Stronger, lighter, and warmer fortifications. It was the subtleties that make things more useful. Our evolution was also dependent on herd animals that we hunted. The animals that lived in Europe included the common animals we know today, but they also had rhinoceros, panthers, 
cave lions, among many others. And reindeer lived in the cold climates. We used animals not just for food, but for tools of all kinds. Reindeer boots and pants and coats, materials for fortifications and artistic expressions. By 30,000 years ago, they developed the ability to track stars, seasons, the moon stages, and correlated them with animal migrations. Therefore, they created the first calendars by carving incremental marks on bones. While it's fantastic for us to stare up in the sky and know what all those balls of fire are and where they came from, we also live in cities and rarely see them anymore. Whereas every night of their lives, they had the galaxy of stars above them, and they must have been awestruck at the majesty and miraculousness of the cosmos. It would have been engraved in them from early on. By 20,000 years ago, the Ice Age was among the worst that they had experienced. Ice covered much of northern Europe. Cro-Magnon survived without the Neanderthal body type due to their ability to imagine, to invent, to develop technical solutions, and then communicate them with others. Eventually, we learned to domesticate animals like reindeer, dogs, and cats around 20,000 to 10,000 years ago. Then we used animals as workers. Finally, humans began to settle down and make permanent settlements in the Middle East and India, where they began large-scale agriculture along fertile valleys and rivers. This coincided with a rapid warming of the planet that remains to this day. Only three times in the past 200,000 years has it been this warm, lasting 20,000 to 30,000 years each. And finally, around 10,000 years ago, they settled down to raise crops and animals on a mass scale, to build permanent structures and official buildings. This is the beginning of modern civilization, what this series is all about. It's likely that there were 10 million humans living on Earth over the past 50,000 years. Then around 10,000 years ago, the numbers increased dramatically. At the conclusion of this episode, and at the beginning of civilization, we find a complex mix of empires and empathetic philosophies, a tradition that remains to this day. Think about it. Only a hundred years ago, our civilization has almost only known empires and kingdoms, which has battled and co-opted science and spirituality. Our modern age is truly remarkable in the history of our civilization and species, as well as life on Earth and in the cosmos, not to mention the miracle of our very existence. The history of our species is not just one of physical changes and technological improvements, but perhaps more importantly, a spiritual evolution. Our history is one of the conflict between gentleness and violence. We came from an environment of dominating and manipulating species to a more accepting one that shares information and educates each other. As we became more and more conscious of ourselves and our environment, we have consistently had to choose between several options that had the effect of causing greater gentleness or violence. Our emerging consciousness gave rise to at least two fundamental questions. What is all this, and how should we act? And the answer to what all this is then affects how to live in the world. On the surface, we call the answers to these questions culture. But on a deeper level, it's the essence of what it means to be a human being, the split man, seemingly forever divided by our higher and lower natures. Thus we have the Garden of Eden story a perfect metaphor that symbolizes our predicament. We realize that, to a greater or lesser extent, we are in control, and that scared us, because that forced responsibility on us. We found ourselves forced to constantly choose, and even inaction was a choice. And these choices had ever greater effects on the nature of our society. On the one end of the spectrum, is our hopes, which includes openness, 
acceptance, vulnerability, compassion, forgiveness, understanding, imagination, caring, which leads to things like art and spirituality. And on the other hand, we have our historic baggage, life as it's always been, our animalistic nature in a hostile world of need, power, control, manipulation, instilling fear and division, violence, and abuse of authority. The Eden Dilemma becomes more significant and particularly crucial when civilization and complex society emerges, when the consequences of our actions have immense impacts on an ever-increasing population that depends on others for survival. It's an arms race between competition and cooperation. The transition to a more gentle world has been chaotic and slow. Consciousness is at the crossroads of these decisions. And even today, we largely can't pay attention to our own consciousness long enough to make sense of it or our society in order to make substantial improvements. It's time for our species to evolve once again. It's possible that the fruit in the Garden of Eden parable was the exploration of our own consciousness, which allows for reflection of our situation in a more harmonious way that leads to gentleness and the potential for a thriving society. We, right now, are the embodiment of living at the height of the conscious evolution of the universe. Try to remember that absolute miracle more often. Try to notice also that we are the animals that woke up, that there are countless other animals that haven't. They are our relatives, each a unique sentient being. The notion of consciousness as the axis has been slow in emerging, but has dramatically picked up steam over our recent evolution, and especially in the past few decades. The reason is that we have finally learned to answer the first question precisely. What is all this? Now that we can eliminate much of the confusion, we can better answer how to live in the world. What the series Evolution of Civilization is all about. If you enjoyed this episode of Enlightened Society, please subscribe, share, and donate. Thank you.